Peter started talking to Jesus about this um, that all falls into the realm of huge official glory can I get an amen on that Jesus immediately goes into verse 21 from that time forth. Began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. I remember when I was in Bible school. And I remember... Read, just reading these scriptures, and I remember at the time I was deeply meditating on a, <clears throat> on a thought that God was working into my being at the time. He was working it in, and that thought was <clears throat> that when you read the Bible, like in the book of Matthew, who do you identify with? And God was teaching me that Christ was my life. And so I said, who do you identify? Do you identify with Peter? Do you identify with Judas? Do you identify with one of the other disciples, John? Who do you identify with? And the Holy Spirit was teaching me, well, you're supposed to be identified with Christ. Christ is your life. If Christ was the life then and is your life now, you, you getting ready for my next statement? If Christ was your, the life then, and he's your life now, then whatever he says or does here, he will continue to be that way, regardless if it was in his incarnate body or in us his body. Do you, do you get that? Okay, so that's, I've been meditating on that for a while, and all of a sudden, in my identifying with Jesus, I read verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And I remember turning to Deb. We weren't even married then. And I turned to her and I read that scripture and I said, if that's true of Jesus then, it's still true of Jesus in me. And I will experience this one day. Little did I know. <laughs> but nonetheless... I was right on. This is our life. We're reading about our life here. <clears throat> then Peter took him and began to re rebuke him. Okay. Why in the world would Peter rebuke him? Because... Peter's view of things is different than Jesus. Peter doesn't, do, does not understand kenosis. Peter thinks that kenosis is simply to reach a plateau called official glory so that we all are officially glorified. And that's what he believes. And so he's saying, no, no, no. We're ta we just talked about, you know, the gates of hell not prevailing and everything. But Jesus immediately turned the subject from official glory to glory of nature. Did you see it? It didn't take him long. And, and then Peter rebukes the thought of how far the glory of nature must go to truly glorify the Father and bring about what God wants. And so Peter took him. I mean, I've always looked at those words. He took Jesus and then began to rebuke him. And I always pictured two hands on Jesus taking him and beginning to rebuke him and saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You've heard me say many times, in other words, he's saying, Not so, Lord. Well, you don't say not so to the Lord. You say yes, Lord. You don't say not so, Lord. You say not so someone, but not to the Lord. You don't say that. 
But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why? Why? For thou savorest not the things that are of God, but those things that are of men. Now, folks, if we could just truly grasp that instead of just reading stuff and thinking we know it because we've read it, Jesus is literally rebuking his top disciple, and he says to him, you, you know, he call, it basically says, get behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest the, not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. The problem with Peter wasn't that he was doing something wrong in the sense of a negative act like rejecting God. He was doing, he was savoring. But he was savoring the things of men while Jesus, speaking of the cross, was savoring the things of God. You can read, the, yes, did you have a? Complete turning point here in like two sentences between mm -hmm. Peter, you're the rock, and then get away from me, Satan, right. is like huge. <laughs> yeah, it really is, and, and that's really a good point because um, the turning point from that is Jesus brings up the cross. Jesus brings up laying down his life. Jesus doesn't speak of great high official glory. All of a sudden he turns it to this. And when he does, Peter's no longer the rock that's having Jesus revealed. He's an offense to God. And it is primarily because of the cross. I mean, if you read this, I mean, you got it. That's true. But the pivotal point is verse 21 where everything changes. And Jesus didn't change. He just put the emphasis back on what he emphasizes. Paul Paul was his main apostle after that, and what did Paul say? God forbid that I glory in anything save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then he says, by whom I'm... See, he didn't glory in the cross that saved him from his sins, or that sends him to heaven, or gets him out of hell. He gloried in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom he is crucified to the world, and the world to him. He's glorying in a cross that crucified him. Yes. You're going to have to speak a little louder only because you're the furthest from a mic in, in the room. The reference you were talking about earlier, I thought about the veiling and the veiling, you know, and this whole thing about Revelation, when the scriptures talk about Revelation, it's always pointing to Christ and us seeing him and, and our relation to him. And so, you know, it's just kind of looking forward because. I hear so many people talk about that they've had this revelation. And people, I hear a lot of people talk about they've had a revelation, but it has nothing to do with Christ. So the reason one is what are we seeing? But the scriptures are very clear about the fact that that revelation is supposed to bring us to that place of seeing who we are in Him and His life in us. Amen. And I think that's some of the things that make this significant when Jesus said, <clears throat> Thou savorest the thing, uh, uh, for thou savorest not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. <clears throat> because this is a mind blower if you comprehend what's being said here. That what God savors is the cross and death and being mistreated by the elders and all that. And you know, it's not about being mistreated. But you understand what I'm saying. That is the subject that changed the whole thing, as, as Mike said. And that is... The thing that when Peter went against that, Jesus said, you don't savor what God savors. And specifically, you know, we, anybody, any Christian, I don't care how old you are or how long you've been a Christian or how far off you are. You don't even have to be a Christian. You can just claim to follow God. As long as savoring the things of God is ethereal, it's no big deal. You can claim that you savor the things of God and and, and nail any subject to that tree. But Jesus brought it up over one subject, and that's the cross. Right? 
Okay, now if that's, tr if that's true, and it is true, because the, it's, all we did was say what the Word of God says, then this also is true. That savoring the things that be of men against God is not just, you know, sinning or, or living worldly or anything. It is going against those who want to give their life at the cross. That's what Jesus called here, savoring the things of men, voiding out the cross. You see what I'm saying? And <clears throat> Jesus' response to that was, you're an offense to me. All right. Now, how many of you love Jesus? Raise your hand. How many of you want to be an offense to Jesus? Raise your hand. Good. There's one. Um, not really. Um, but, okay. So, um, there is one clear way to get Jesus riled up. And that is to be resisting the cross. Or resisting that others go to the cross. Yes. Right. He had no idea. He thought he was just dead on. Oh no, Lord, far be it. Because you know, we're with you and you're the real deal and we know you're not supposed to be a cross, but we know who you are. And it just really drives home the point of how desperate we need the Holy Spirit to open up the Lord's mind to us. Because we cannot, Amen. cannot, cannot see it. Well, I mean, as plainly as I can say it, we don't know what to savor. I mean, people need to cry out for God to help them see that these are the things that he savors. Because if you really love God, if you really love God, you're not going to want to go against the things that he savors. Amen? I mean, if you really love someone, you're going to want to go with the things that they savor. If you really love God, you're going to want to go with that. Clearly... They don't know what God savors. And I'm going to tell you what he savors. He savors someone who doesn't lift himself up. He savors someone who doesn't have to have official glory. Or that doesn't cry when it's taken away. Or that doesn't spend most of their energy striving to gain it. He savors uh, someone who would actually die for people who have that at, those attitudes that, that are seeking glory and seeking the things that men savor and trying to be uh, honored by men and that will do ruthless things to their fellow man to achieve those ends. He, God savors someone who would actually die for those men. That would make the one dying of greater than the ones he's dying for in character, in nature. Is that, does anybody see that? That's, that makes the person dying in God's eyes a mammoth king, a, a king of kings, a, a every knee shall bow type person because all men are, are selfish and self-centered and self-focused and, and preoccupied with self, how we appear, where we're going, how this will help where I'm going, how this will, you know. And Jesus is laying all that down to die for us. That's what God savors. Now, there are Christians that will kill you for believing that. Well, I'm just, I'm just being honest. They will, I mean... Jesus is the one who said that. You know those words that he says, and men shall kill you thinking they do God's service? Those came out of the mouth of Jesus. They will kill you thinking they do God's service because now it's all about resurrection to them. 
But the resurrected lamb is the one who's resurrected. God didn't resurrect any old selfish, self-centered, prideful thing. He resurrected the lamb who died to make us one with him. And all glory goes to him because we're one and we are meant to be of his kind now. We're meant to par be partakers of the divine nature. We're meant to have Christ as life and not just live for God using our pride and our jealousy and all of the, the traits that were crucified as means to serve him or something. You know, ambition to... To make our way so that we become something. You know, if being born again and Christ coming in you and being your life isn't being something enough, I don't know what's going to satisfy. Literally having the literal Son of God as the true vine life flowing in you, living in you, it don't get any higher than that. And I, I remember when I was in Bible school coming to the reality that if you're a son of God, by the nature of Christ, by Christ, if you're a son of God, then if somebody offered you the position of king, you, couldn't, you can't get any higher than being son. God is your father, your source. Jesus is your life. You can't get any higher. There is no higher position on earth. But, you see... We're not, many Christians today are not living in the realm of reality as God sees it. They're living in the realm of ministry in this earth. And, and it's just, Christianity is just another business name. You know, there's the business of, of selling cars, new cars and all this stuff. And there's the business of selling insurance. And there's the business of this and that. And there's the business of Christianity and religion. And it's just, it's all run by the same principles. But because we stamp it and write Christianity on it and then have a little meeting before our business day and we pray and ask God to bless our sales. And if Jim, you're doing that, forgive me, but I'm... <laughs> but, but I mean, if, if that's all that it's about, if that's really what we're doing, then it's, we, are doing, we are proliferating the same business tactics, but we're adding a few little elements in, and every, every area does add their own that makes them specific to them. Yes? Well, if we're just going to do that, let's go do something more lucrative. Amen. And that was my wife speaking. <laughs> the, only, the only thing that's holding her back is the fact that she's married to the pastor. <laughs> well, just look out on the day that I die, because let her rip. <clears throat> All right. Um. So then Jesus says this stuff about savoring the things of God and what, what savoring the things of man represents, which is a rejection of the cross. Then said Jesus unto his disciple, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. If, and then he says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So here it is. I mean, I, I'm telling you, just a good old-fashioned Baptist or Methodist reading of the Bible and the believing of what it says ought to affect, I mean, ought to affect us. You know, this, this isn't what I just described, folks. I'm, let me just make this clear. Isn't deeper life. What I just described isn't Christ is life theology. What I just described is Bible. I don't care what denomination you are. I don't care who you are. This book has the final word, and I'm not twisting anything. I, am, I want the Lord, you know? I remember also when I was first born again, the biggest fear I had was that some teacher of mine would deceive me. 
And I walked around going, oh, my God, you know, because I knew I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know, you know, and that really scared me. I mean, it's like, I don't want to be deceived. I said that over and over. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be, you know what happened? I got deceived. Somebody deceived. And it happened several times enough where I went, I will be deceived. And I said, so here's what I, (laughs) so here's what I came up with. I said, I need to get in the word and know for myself. I don't need to ever just listen to someone. Now, you should listen to people, but you should check it out in the word, find out if it's true, if the, if the way that it's going is this, and it's, you know, when your Bible goes like this and you just keep going and it's saying the same thing, something's up. Most Christians read one verse out and go off, and it, you read around, and it has not, whatever they said has nothing to do with anything around it. But when you can just keep going like this and go, look, and it also says this, something's up. We ought to take, sit up, take notice, and go, my God, maybe there's something to this. And that's what I did because, because when I heard the preaching of the cross, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I was like Paul. Paul didn't like it either. <laughs> I didn't like it. I went, no. I was, you know, because when I got saved, the first church I went to was Kenneth Copeland's. Kenneth Copeland, right, right after salvation, days. I was in a church where Kenneth Copeland was the evangelist for that church. Not visiting, was the evangelist. That's his home church. And all I heard about was prosperity and faith and healing and everything's going to be wonderful. And all you got to do is cast out the devil and use your authority and everything like this. And just can't. And then I came to this Bible school where they're talking about, you know, dying and all this stuff. And everything within me except one little part said, get me out of here. This is crazy. I never heard this before. Well, just because you never heard it before doesn't mean it's not in the word of God. Do you know everything in the Word? Is it possible you could actually hear something you never heard before? I mean, it's just a thought. Those are the thoughts that ran through my mind. My thought was, well, I don't know everything. Maybe this could be right. That's what I said. And, I, and then finally, you know, the Lord kept bombarding me with it. And finally I said, okay, okay, look. If this is right, show me. If what I've believed before is wrong, show me, and I'll go with you. And he went, fair enough. Bang! I went, oh, my God, what the heck was I believing? What was I? But you see, I only had about ten scriptures, and all my theology was based on one verse pulled out of context. And I want Jesus, and I want the truth, and I don't want to be deceived. And the only hope to keep me from not being deceived is for me to stay in this book and to know this book all the way from Genesis to the maps. And that's, that ought to be your dedication, too. But I can't put that in you. Only the Lord can. <clears throat> all right. I should read. Because now we've, in the last two classes, we've actually done three sentences. When someone did see Jesus in his true glory, he acknowledged it, but then took it away and then pointed them towards acts of self-giving, which is what um, verse 20 of Matthew 16, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Come on, grab that, folks. How many times do you do that? (laughs) Peter gets hold of it, says, I'm seeing something of you beyond the veil here. And Jesus gets excited and says, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my father, you're seeing the real me. And now I'm telling you, Peter, don't tell anybody. And when you see something glorious in the word about Jesus, what's the first thing you want to do? <laughs> Go tell everyone. Now, what is, the, what, is, what is the partial motivation behind doing that? Official glory. Look what I saw. Not look at Jesus, but look what I saw. Okay? 
Well, that's not too bad, except for you're going to hell for it. No, not really. I'm joking. But, <laughs> but it, is not the, it is not the motivation and nature of Jesus. Would you two young ladies quit jabbering back there? <clears throat> Been a long, long time since I've had to correct you two. <laughs> publicly, I mean. Publicly. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, you know, Jesus immediately gets Peter and the disciples who are standing around and listen off of this official glory thing. Immediately. Don't tell anybody. From now on, I'm going to start talking about me going and dying and laying down my life. That's what I want you to think about. That's what I want you to be plugged into. Um, but at the same time, when he's talking about going to the cross there, he's talking about self-giving. He's talking about the glory of nature. He's taking it off of official glory. He's a man in kenosis. He lives there. He walks there. He speaks there. He thinks there. He thinks in that manner. His mind has been renewed to that reality, and that's how he lives. And he doesn't have ulterior motives behind it to gain something. Give, and it shall be given unto you. I give only because I want to get. No, I give because it is the nature of Christ to do that. And yeah, you will, you will get. You know, That's not always the blessing we think it is. I mean, me and Deb would go, okay, it's time to forsake all. we got too much stuff. And we'd gather up stuff, and they got a garage sale coming up. we gather up all this stuff, and we'd go give a bunch of stuff away, and we'd go, go just give, find people, and give all this stuff away. And we'd feel real good because we'd emptied a small portion of our house of all the stuff that we got, but we were giving, and we were giving in the Lord, and we did it in the right spirit. Six months later, it shall be given unto you, and you got more junk than you had before you gave it all away. You know, I mean, we think, oh, it's all about getting more. You know, it's not always the blessing you think it is. <laughs> okay. Just, just letting you know. <clears throat> all right. Um, Jesus did not seek out occasions for approval on other levels of glory. He did not drive out money changers to, sh to show power. Would you sort of agree with that? Yep. But get this next part. He did not drive out money changers to show power or uphold God's honor. But the honor of his father, for not God's honor, the honor of his father, for this speaks of lineage, seed, family nature, because by doing what they were doing, they were violating the spirit of the family and of this seed, and they missed who and how God is. And that's why he drove them out. We think he's standing up for, you know, God. Well, you know, come on. I mean, really, God doesn't need someone to stand up for him. I mean, I think he's plenty big enough. He'll make it okay. You know, it's like last conference. I said a, a few things uh, jokingly about Brother Lumen in uh, Arkansas. And... Um, I noticed a few people getting ruffled, and they wanted to stand up for him. And I thought, you know, he doesn't really need anybody to stand up for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> if, he if he can't come to me and say something, or doesn't, or won't, you, nothing you're going to do or say is going to make much difference anyway. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, and I, I made those last statements about the money changers because a lot of times we're all involved in standing up for what's right. Folks, uh, I don't know how to say it, so I'm going to give my best attempt here. For the most part, when we're standing up for what's right, we're standing up for something that is outside of us, something that we have, we have said, well, God holds this as important, so I'm going to stand up for that. <clears throat> Instead of being conformed to a certain way, and therefore you stand up because it's as if the Lord himself stands up on the inside of you. 
there really is a difference. Uh, one is that you could actually kill someone thinking you do God's service and they were of God. You're standing up for something. And you think you're right. But you're not right. The other one is being right on the inside by Christ, by the king himself ruling over you and therefore your pride or your prejudices do not rule you, your actions, your mouth, your whatever. The king does. And you, and you know what you'll do? You'll find yourself rebuking things that most people would have blessed. And you'll find yourself blessing things that people would rebuke. I'm being honest with you because Peter rebuked Jesus. And God was blessing him. So I'm just saying, this is not about getting all your doctrinal ducks in order. And when I picture that, I picture all these little rubber duckies that you put in your bathtub, all in a nice straight line, all of them outside of you. You see what I'm saying? And as long as they're outside of you, I'm going to stand up for this, this ducky right now. And then I'm going to stand up for that ducky. And I'm going to, you know, you're just, you're just picking random things, you know. And, and I've seen people that do that. I mean, <clears throat> you know, somebody says, for example, somebody says, well, so-and-so got a divorce, so that's it. I mean, God hates divorce, and I'm against them, and da-da-da-da, and all this kind of stuff. But if you read the Old Testament, God divorced Israel. He didn't say he hates divorced people. <laughs> so we stay, oh, then I'm just against you. Well, you know what? Somebody could actually go through something, and, and, and not that I'm planning on divorcing my wife anytime soon, but, you know, we're, you know, in the far future. But, <laughs> but I mean, we, you know, we see somebody, and we're going we're gonna to stand against that, and people mess up, okay? I want you to know that. You, you've messed up, and you'll mess up again, but they may actually still be of God. Now, that's, you know, and maybe we should delete this from the thing, because most people will just want to string me up, but folks... I'm not talking about not standing against divorce. I'm talking about choosing external doctrines and making a stand for them instead of having the principle of life concerning that doctrine cause us to stand up because it's life and it's Christ to do it. You may do the same thing, but I'm not just talking about, you know, I'm, t I'm speaking of externals that began to be our motivators. <clears throat> All right. We've got to keep going here. <laughs> if you know the throne and not the man, you may misinterpret many things he does. Because you just know the throne. You know the law. You know the rules. But you don't know the heart. I've had that happen here. I had somebody who was secretary in our church, and they didn't understand me at all, and they misrepresented me on the phone and to people that would come through the front door to of the office, and they would continually misrepresent my heart and my spirit because they knew the throne, they knew the rules, but they didn't know me. <clears throat> First, you must know God in spirit and in nature. Then you can start standing up for him because you're one with him. And what he stands up for stands up inside of you because of oneness, because of like nature, because of the same nature. Um, I'm trying to rush now. At resurrection, the lamb would be highly exalted for his self-giving. This is not only seen in Philippians, but in Revelation. Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain and, you know, Right? He's honored because of his self-giving. He's not honored because he was the son of God. It was the son of man that was raised up and seated at the right hand of God the Father. It was a selfless man that is honored. <clears throat> All right. So 
Uh, but he is the son of God, so wherever men acknowledge him as that, or son of David, he responds to them on the level that they give him. Um, how much time we got left? 20, 25 minutes, because I, I almost feel like reading uh, a section here and just, just reading that to get it done, because I am so far behind. <clears throat> All right, I want to talk about our reaction to people in position, people who are kings or people who are great sports figures or people who are Olympic winners or, <laughs> or people who are, uh, how we respond to that. And I can tell you that since we respond to the externals, I mean, if some guy, you know, we know won a gold medal, then we, we give him preference. We give him special honor. We think more highly of him. When his character may be 100 times worse than you or anybody else. But we're honoring them because, well... One who has the power to change things is honored, not for the spirit of benevolence, but for what he personally possesses in terms of talents. We are, well, I think I wrote that. We, we honor what dazzles us. <laughs> Whether it's a movie star or whatever, we honor what dazzles us, you know. And so, you know, our heart goes pitter-pat over this or that. But, but do we see behind their veil, and what ugly thing do we see back there? And the answer is, if you are wise and financially able, you orchestrate your honored life and position in such a manner that no one discovers what you are behind your veil. Do you understand what I'm saying? That could be, you know, that could be anybody. I mean, that could be a basketball player or a golfer or, or anything, you know. Uh, yes? Or a generally kind, happy, and outgoing, fun-loving mm -hmm. person. Yes. But it is, and, and here's the deal. Like with Jesus, you are not going to really know what's behind the, the veil until trouble comes. Will he defend himself? Will he use his, he said, you know, Jesus said this, I could have called 10,000 angels. I mean, I always think of that. Why do you say 10,000? Because in the Old Testament, he sent one angel and wiped out 100,000 people. You know, just one angel goes, whoosh, no, oh, you know. So now Jesus calls 10,000, we're all in trouble. You know. He could have. The question, it begs the question. Maybe in the question in Jesus' mind. Did I really deserve this? Have I done anything wrong? Did I mistreat anybody? This is unjust. This is unfair. Right? Well, it was unjust. It was unfair. If this was all based on just and fair. But there is a higher thing, and that is lamb nature, or, or the nature of Christ, or... God in his essence. Which doesn't look at it as unfair. He looks at it as, he would say, I look at this as me. This is, you know, and the, the Godhead standing there. This is the way we are. This is what we do because of who we are. The father says, I so loved, I gave my only begotten son. I gave my best. I gave my highest for crap. You know what I'm saying? For, for the worst of the worst, I gave the best of the best. The son says, well, I love the father so much, I came and did his will. And, you know, and you see this 
selfless. And then the Holy Spirit goes, well, sure, I'll go down there and spend 2,000 years talking to them, trying to get through their thick skulls about this selfless one that came and died on the cross, and I'll reveal him. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing the Godhead inter- interview up on the thing and all the reporters asking them questions. And they say, well, let us tell you a little bit about ourselves. This is... This is <clears throat> This is the way our family is. This is the family of God. This is who we are. This is not a hardship. Um, I remember, I was also in Bible school at this time, and I was doing a, a lot of searching on the Lamb because the Spirit of God was dealing with me about it. And I remember, I remember the Spirit of God saying something like this to me. He said, If God is a lamb, mankind would never have known what he truly is without the cross. The cross actually was the biggest stage upon which he could prove who he really is. And man, you can see how that would just radically rattle my brain because, you know, it's like, The cross was the biggest stage, the grandest moment, the highest point in which we might grasp. And that's why these people, they don't know why, but that's why they wear these crosses around their neck and all that. You know what I mean? That's why they know there's something honorable about it, but they still don't fully get it. But that God would come down and die for the worst of mankind... And then marry him, join him to himself, and let us be called by his, you know, it's unfathomable. But the depth of the cross showed the deepest heart of the Lamb of God. So, um, the mighty want to be acquainted with others who are mighty to enhance their esteem. Is that true? Why do you think they buy, you know, $5,000 a night plate for some banquet that Sarah Palin or, or Clinton or somebody puts on, why would somebody do that? Well, in some cases, they got so much money they're just looking for an outlet because they just, you know, but that's, that's few and far between. For the most part, they want to say, I was there, I, you know, I shook his hand, you know. I mean, I, I remember when you know, I think it was, I don't remember which president, but, you know, people were saying uh, he came through town, you know, and in this particular town, it was in the paper and in all the news, and these people were saying, oh, I, I shook his hand. And another one said, well, we actually stopped and, you know, had a few words and stuff like that. And, and they were all just like, Oh, I'll never wash my hands. Oh, this was, the, this was the greatest moment. I mean, that's the way they were talking. This was the greatest moment of my life. And I thought, you know, the only one in that crowd that I see, all of them reaching over and touching his hand and him reaching up there, the only one in that whole crowd that I see has any clue about what that guy is really like is that lady next to him called his wife. She knows when, when depression hits, she knows when he's hurting. She knows how he's going to react. She knows what he's really on the inside, who he really is. And folks, until we become bride, until we've come into union with him, I don't mean bride by name and title. Come on, that's official glory. I mean in oneness of nature, the glory of nature. We don't really know what the Lord is like. But if you do, guess what? The Bible starts opening up and you start seeing these things that just keep following one line because you comprehend the essence of God. All right. How much time? I'm doing pretty good then. Um, uh, The mighty want to be acquainted with others who are mighty to enhance their esteem. 
the outcasts who were comfortable around Jesus, he gained, gained no esteem by all these outcasts and, and harlots and, you know, uh, uh, tax collectors. And y you know what I'm saying? He didn't get any esteem. And apparently, he doesn't know how to work the, the system. Jesus, you're doing this all wrong. And the disciples several times along the way said, look, you know, I think we can do a better job of this. Why don't we try, you know, <laughs> yeah, a little marketing. That's exactly right. A little marketing strategy here because you're really not doing this well. I mean, we could be big time quicker than all of this, but you keep hanging out with the riffraff and nobody wants to hang out with you because you hang out with them and it's not building their esteem and making them look like they're something. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, I've gone through that in relationship to this church and thought, man, if for no other reason, I need to get out of this church because of the people that are part of it. I'm kidding. Because <clears throat> you can't gain, you know, you can't gain any esteem. And yet, what's funny is, I've got the lowest esteem in the whole group here. So you're the ones that are suffering because you're hanging out with me. We condemn one lower than ourselves that we might feel righteous and good about ourselves. Um, Jesus was the son of God. He was the son of David. He was these things, but he veiled it. Any glory Jesus would seek would not be based on what he was as God or what would be bestowed by title or position. He sought only to manifest the beauty of a nature in its pure form without frills. And folks, Jesus did a lot of it without frills. Whenever honor came from that, whether looked upon as glorious or just being used, meaning Jesus is just being used because it, uh, um, because it was self-giving, Man was to grasp the excellencies of a better, a better way, a beauty, a nature. In other words, he, he intentionally veiled everything that would wow us, that would dazzle us. That was, he intentionally, and again, we talk about the miracles, and we'll get into that when I finish this thing on the son of David. But there's a whole other angle of all that that is not what we think. Um, It, because it was self man was to grasp, or he wanted us to grasp the excellencies of a better way, a beauty, a nature. He wanted us to see him for who he is and not what he can do for us. Now, can he do it for us? Yes, of course. You know, I mean, some of you who are not married, would you want to marry somebody? who just married you for what you can do for them in terms of outward while they never really get to know you? You know? And the answer is no, no. You want people to really know you and if they know you, and you know, people sometimes are moved with, you know, how you appear, you know. In my BC days, I played in a rock band and you know, you got long hair and you play music and you sing and, you know, you dress cool and so you must be cool. Well, I'm cool, but not based on what you think. <laughs> you know, I mean, because, uh, uh, and most guys in the band didn't care as long as someone was interested in them. But I always had this desire that somebody would come along and just know me and really know me and not be wowed by anything other than what's truly me so that if there was a relationship, that relationship would be based on reality and not frills and fluff and ruffles and, you know. Anyway. <laughs> All other excellencies were given up. He just, he wanted this thing of beauty in nature. All other excellencies were given up. 
Whatever glory there was would not be the glory of the brightness of God that blinds because of greatness, nor the highness of position as king that must be bowed to. Just, you know, I mean, Jesus could just, you know, we see that on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we'll deal with that in another teaching along these lines. But Jesus could have just, you know, and just had everybody just see him in his brightest glory. And, you know, no man has seen God and lived. Just kill us all because he's so bright and beautiful and glorious. Transfiguration. Yes. And that's why I said we'll deal with that later oh, okay. on. Because, well, I'll just tell you straight out. Right after that happened, he said, tell no man about these things. I mean, that's just his style. That's, that's a man who's in kenosis. All right. What, would we perceive something higher that goes to the essence of who God is? Or would we seek only the trappings that give us our perception of who we think God is? Omniscient omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, such like. Folks, all-knowing still doesn't tell us who he is. It just tells us what he knows. You see what I'm talking about? Uh, All-power, omnipotent, still doesn't tell you who he is. You know, you, you know, you can stick a man in the presidency and give him all power and let him know stuff nobody else knows and basically his presidency will be will be run according to his nature okay it's going to come down to that <clears throat> um this glory would not flash forth and demand by virtue uh demand honor by virtue of overwhelming us it would have to be caught perceived by one who notices contrast and sees where most men do not see that's what I believe the revelation of Christ is folks I mean I think that's just a glorious beautiful picture right there of the revelation of Christ it's just us trying to see past all of the trappings and all of the things, uh, omniscient, all the things that if you went to seminary, that's what they would teach you. Uh, but what is omniscience? What is, you know, all of these different aspects, omnipotence? And you'd come away knowing all that and still not know him. Because why? How do you get to know someone? You've got to spend time with them. They, that person and you can spend time with a person and still not know them they have to open their heart to you they have to open their heart to you where where you begin to know someone maybe better than the person knows themselves because you've looked more into their essence than they have. (laughs) They don't know who they are. Most people don't know who they are. Do you know that? Most people do not know who they are. They think they are what people have told them. Oh, you're a good musician, so that's what you are. Oh, you're, you're you're a happy person, so that's what you are. Well, you know, what is a... You know, like back in the 60s, what does a happy person do when they get into their teenage years and they don't feel happy, but everybody said, oh, you're such a happy person. You go, well, then I'm insane or something because I don't feel very happy. Oh, no, 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 you're just, you know, and you go to somebody who knows you and they say, oh, cheer up, you're just a happy person. You're going, I just want to strangle you. Now, you'd never say that, but I mean, that's what you're thinking, you know. You know, for the most part, I'm really not very happy. (laughs) But when you say that to somebody who has a preconceived idea who doesn't know you, they'll go, oh, no, you're just going through a hard time. You'll get over it. Yeah, when I go get dad's gun and kill everybody in the house. You know, I mean, that stuff happens. Where does that stuff come from? Because I think that people don't, 
you know, aren't known. And more importantly than that, God isn't known. We don't know Jesus. We don't know our Father. We, we don't perceive, I mean, that, that, that last statement, I just, I thank the Lord, the Holy Spirit for giving. This glory would not flash forth and demand by virtue of its ability to overwhelm us that we honor him. It would, not ha- it would have to be caught, perceived by one who notices contrasts and sees where most men do not see. Again, that's the revelation of Christ. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about deep spiritual knowledge of mysteries. We're talking about knowing the Lord. (laughs) And anyone who puts it on the basis of just knowing deep spiritual things is still not seeking the Lord. We just want to know him and, 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 (coughs) and peer in behind the veil of his flesh into his essence. Yes, had your hand up? Like watching Braveheart and loving the movie, but not loving it enough to become one with the one you see. It's like, if you really love that essence, you will partake of it more than your old life that wants to have honor. Because that's what the bride does. She says, you're worth being my life, not just being my adoration. I'll put myself down for honor and everything else to be yours in the way you are. Because he's beautiful to everybody, but few will let him live in them because they want that honor. Well, I just know that uh, Jesus, when he was at the, the, the well with the Samaritan woman, just the statement that he made about There cometh a time when men will want to know God, and they will, when they know him, they will know him in spirit and in truth. And he said they're not going to know him here at this well or there in Jerusalem because those places are not what matters. It's this place, his heart. And perceiving him, that's where it matters. So it doesn't matter whether you live there, here, whatever. To find his heart is the true place where God wants you to to know him. So anyway, let's pray. Father, we just so thank you for the preciousness of the Holy Spirit who prompts us, who, who touches us, in deep recesses of our heart and says to truly know yourself you need to know the one that you're one with so father we we abandon all thoughts of trying to get people to know us in our essence and in our deepest being and we set forth on our journey to know you in your essence and deepest being because to know you is to know ourselves because we're one with you and that we will never truly discover who we are until we discover who you are in our oneness with you. So may we have our eyes open to see your heart, Father. May we know you in spirit and in truth, and may that your heart be the place that we seek to arrive at to find the height of religion, because there we will find the height of the the being of the everlasting God himself. And we will know as we are known. By grace we ask these things, not because we deserve it. So be gracious and manifest the grace of the death and resurrection of Christ toward us. And open our eyes. And open our hearts. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.